Now, with respect to the evaluation report, Post says that the report and data from all sources of information shall be considered. That is, there has to be a data integration uh, component to the evaluation. The evaluator's determination shall not be based on one single data source unless clinically justified. Now, does that mean that you would never disqualify a person because of validity scale elevations? No. Not if you can clinically justify it. Uh, one of the things we'll talk about a little bit later, in, in a bit more detail, but I want to plant the seed now, is that in the, in the process of data integration, Mike talked about this uh, last year at IUCP, along with Yossi, and, and that is that we have historically treated psychological testing as generating hypotheses that we then test against uh, or, or look for confirmatory evidence in behavior, right? I, I think a reframe of that is, is justified. Mike and Yossi presented it, and I think, I think compellingly so. Tell people who Yossi is. Oh, Yossi, Yossi sorry about that. Yossi Ben-Pora, who is the uh, uh, a co-author of the MMPI-2 restructured form, and uh, a, uh, a, a international figure in personality assessment. And uh, the, the assertion, I think the reframe, is that psychological testing produces findings. This is behavior. These aren't hypotheses. Now, that behavior isn't necessarily more valid or reliable than other data sources. But if you are going to take test data known in the literature to have predictive meaning and trump it by interview behavior that has no literature anchors indicating that it has a higher validity or predictive utility than the test results, you're on shallow ground. Don't you think? But we tend to do that, I think. I, I have certainly been guilty of that in my practice. That the behavior that I see in front of me in my office, I elevate as more meaningful than the test data. That's especially true when the background is clean, the person's really nice, the person presents really well, and I've got these really wacky test results. And I'll, and I'll somehow say to myself, you know, he's naive, he's young. I'll go over some critical items with him, and he'll say, oh, no, I didn't mean that. And he'll have some rationale and justification for some idiosyncratic interpretation of what he really meant when he said, sometimes I hear voices that others don't hear. Because I'm a really very attentive listener, so I hear things, you know, okay. Still, these are findings. And the, and, and the reason, the, how we, I came and, and Mike and, and Yossi ben Porath came to the same conclusions was through uh, an ongoing process of post-mortem analyses of test results after a person we found qualified ended up doing something really bad. And we look at the test results, and in so many of these cases, the test results predicted this behavior, but we found a way to uh, usurp its authority on the basis of our observed behaviors or clinical impressions or beliefs or wishful thinking about the candidate. So why do a clinic? Well, there is uh, an article. The question is, so why do a clinical interview at all? There's two answers um, that I think are both relevant. One is because uh, regulation and practice standards require it. Uh, the, the, the more important question is, why do they require it? And I, and, and I think that there's good reason for that. Um, and, and, that's, and, the, and, and the other is because we're normally predicting low base rate behaviors. Low base rate behaviors 
uh, our ability to predict them is always limited. And there are always going to be risk factors that in the actuarial literature are not covered in the, that are, that are not covered in the actual, actuarial literature. So if, you, if we limit our prediction only to those only to those risk factors that are known in the literature to be associated with an outcome, then we would be ignoring new risk factors that absolutely shout out to you mm -hmm. that they should be considered. For example, uh, when we look at workplace violence, uh, we, we know that there are 19 risk factors and 10 protective factors that the literature consistently finds. Should I ignore, though, one that is not covered among those 19, simply because it's a low base rate event, uh, but that to any normal, uh, casual, common sense observer would say, oh my god, that has meaning. In an actuarial model, you would be forced to say, yes, you ignore it. But that would be most applicable if you were trying to predict from a large group to a remote uh, outcome. But if you're trying to predict on an individual or nomothetic basis, you, you, you're going to have to include other <coughs> risk factors that might not be included in the actuarial evidence. So that's, and that's only going to come from the form of, of a clinical interview. There's an article, a chapter coming out though in the Handbook of Psychology, Mike Cutler is the author of it, that is a compelling read and it's an argument for actuarial predictions of police officers, police officer applicants and does question properly so, utility of the interview. So I, I think that there's, that there's good argument for both sides. It's an interesting debate. At this point, it's moot in most places because the standard of practice, the IACP guidelines require it, you'd be operating outside the standard of practice. The question really is how much weight do you place on it when you have other solid evidence that includes psychological testing? So let's talk about the evaluation report. We talked about data need to come from all data sources. And then here is uh, something that there's, I'm sure, a lot of room for discussion about. And that is, the report shall include a determination of the candidate's psychological suitability for exercising the powers of a peace officer. Now, I've long been an advocate for a dichotomous judgment in psychological screening. Most states that have a statutory requirement ultimately require you to make a dichotomous judgment. Person meets the qualification standards, person does not meet the qualification standards. Years ago, the IACP pre-employment guidelines said that the psychological should just be one part of the hiring process and it should not be determinative. That doesn't work in states like California and the other 17 states, or the other, uh, the other 19 states that require a uh, a, an affirmative statement that the candidate meets the qualification standards, that is, meets the, statu the statutory exclusionary uh, provisions. It doesn't work in those states. In California, you're going to have to say one way or another, this person meets 1031F or does not meet 1031F. Meets post standards, does not meet post standards. That does not preclude other rating systems like A through F that you may overlay on top of that. Uh, that are either useful internally or useful for educating to your ultimate consumer, the police agency. So I called Shelley Spielberg yesterday just to make sure that I'm going to be representing this correctly. That if you use an A through F or any other range, must you also use a dichotomous? Yes. And the answer is yes. That when post audits the um, the record, and they go to the background, uh, the, the personnel record, and they're going to look for a certification, they're going to look for a, a form that says that the person meets the post standards in 1031. Now that can come in the form of A through F, but it has to be clearly delineated that at, what, at which of those points is it regarded that the person meets or doesn't meet. <coughs> So you can, you can overlay a model on top of that that has a range. As long as it's clear to the auditor what, what demarcates a qualification or qualified applicant from an unqualified applicant. Make, make sense? Mm -hmm. Okay. 
on the surface that would appear to contradict the intent of that regulation, which was to deprive people from making subjective or discretionary judgments about appropriateness for hire. Uh, you mean a, a model of, of A through F versus yes or no? Well, uh, the, the argument is that an, an A through F rating deprives the, yeah. it, it, who, who does it deprive? They it want to deprive. The hiring authority from exercising subjective judgment. Oh, you're saying that they want, Post wants to deprive the hiring authority of subjective judgment? Yeah. I don't think that's true. I don't think it's true. The lawyers. Because, because. Well, say that's true for every other hurdle. Well, the reason why I say it's untrue, and my reason why I think it's untrue, is because they've already said they want the agency to communicate to you what their unique individual standards are. That's an, that's an iterative process, don't you think, Joe? Again, on the surface, it would appear to contradict the original intent of that requirement, which is to prevent people in civil service from making discretionary or I want to hire my brother-in-law kinds of judgment. Yes. Well, I'm not quite sure I follow it, because but in the end, is the is making the determination of, is, is the one making the determination of whether or not the candidate meets qualification standards. How is it that the agency is allowed, how is it that the argument holds that the agency is being permitted to be um, subjectively? Because you provide yes, a ranking system for them to, for them to choose, you know, no, you I'm going to take my A's first and my B's. Position. I mean, that may be the underlying thing. I'm going to take my A's first and I'll go to the B's and I'll take the C's. Maybe I won't hire anyone when we get past that for people who use C minus or D. Right. So we'll let them die on the list. Is what no, 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 no. Yeah, no. I don't think that's not, that's not what I've yeah, been trying to say. What I've been trying to say is the expectation from Post is that if the agents, if you use an A through F and you have an A, B, C, C minus, D, F, is that correct? Is that the way it normally yeah. is? Okay. If you have that, then you, in conjunction with the agency, need to establish where the qualification, unqualification line is. And if it's C minus, then what you say is, asterisk, on this scale, C minus and above is considered a qualified candidate consistent with the provisions of, of, of 9055 and 1031F. D and F are regarded as unqualified vis-a-vis 1031F. And 955. If that's if that's the footnote, my understanding from Shelley is you've met post requirements. My comment was the original intent. This goes back some 25 years with post was to prevent the kind of good old boy decision making that was going on in Washington. Sure, I know. I, I I have no doubt about that, Joe. But if if you have an agreement with an agency as to where the line is drawn. And some agency says, I want to set the line at B. Others say, I want to set it at C minus. And you, psychologists, apply that across the board, then there's no room for the employer to subjectively hire whoever they, whoever they want. Is there? Sure there is. Yes, sure. They can hire anyone from A through C minus. Yeah. Well, I understand, but they're all qualified, so who cares? Yes, but some pigs are more qualified than other pigs. <laughs> No, what I'm saying is they would they would have to hire them because they have been given a conditional offer of employment. David, let them die on the list. That's practically, yeah, they that's don't have what to I, 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 I see what you're saying. So, you're, so what you're saying is when you give feedback to the agency, beyond qualified or unqualified, regardless of whether it's in the form of a rating system or in the form of a narrative, they're going to use that information to let them die on the list. If they my, my have, have I, have I, absolutely. Have I accurately repeated? Yes. Okay. Yeah. My preference for the model is for pilot certification, peace officer certification. Right. When you take a test to become a pilot, you either pass the test or you fail the test. You are not an A or B or a C minus. Yeah, uh, but it, you know it's funny because the FAA doesn't apply that same standard to flight control operator. That I don't know. They have a lot of data upon which they use to make these decisions. But nonetheless, uh, I, I, your, your, point, your point is well taken, and I think that that's going to come into play as we talk about content of report. 